Good afternoon. It is the 28th of November in the year 2020. It is 12.03 in the afternoon, Central Standard Time here in Wisconsin Rapids. And this will be the conclusion of John Bunyan's work on the straight gate. Now, before I get started on it, um, I'd like to remind some of you who are listening to this that uh, I'm also working on a book on the history of the papacy by J.A. Wiley. And I would encourage all of you who are listening who have not yet begun on that, on that series, that book, please listen to it. Because you will learn, as I have learned in, in reading it to you, that the Roman Catholic Church has completely invaded our way of life from the church, from the pulpit, even into the secular world. It is completely dominated by the Roman church. And you will see this and understand it as you go through and listen to what Wiley wrote back in 1849. And you'll see that it's still present today. Anyway, without further ado, we'll finish this here up on the straight gate by John Bunyan. Second, the words by way of observation. I come now to give you some observations from the words, and they may be three. First, when men have put in all the claim they can for heaven, but few will have it for their inheritance. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Second, great therefore will be the disappointment that many will meet with at the day of judgment. For many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Third, going to heaven therefore will be no trivial business. Salvation is not got by a dream, and they that would then have that kingdom must now strive lawfully to enter. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. First, I shall speak chiefly and yet but briefly to the first of these observations, to wit, that when men have put in all the claim they can to their or to the kingdom of heaven, but few will have it for their inheritance. The observation standeth of two parts. First, that the time is coming when every man will put in whatever claim they can to the kingdom of heaven. And second, there will be but few of them that put in claim thereto that shall enjoy it for their inheritance. First, all will put in what claim they can to the kingdom of heaven. I shall speak but a word or two to the first part of the observation, because I have prevented my enlargement thereon by my explication upon the words. But you find in the 25th of Matthew that all they on the left hand of the judge did put in all the claim they could for this blessed kingdom of heaven. If you should take them on the left hand, as most do, for all the sinners that shall be damned, then that completely proves the first part of the observation, for it is expressly said, Then shall they, all of them jointly, and every one apart. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when we saw thus and thus, and did not minister unto thee, Matthew chapter 25, verse 44. And I could here bring you in the plea of the slothful servant, or the cry of the foolish virgins. I could also here enlarge upon that passage. Lord, Lord, have we not eaten and drank in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets? But these things are handled already, in the handling of which is this first part of the observation. And it's proved. Wherefore, without more words, I will, God assisting by his grace, descend to the second part thereof, to wit, 
There will be but few of them that put in claim thereto that will enjoy it for their inheritance. I shall speak distinctly to this part of the observation, and shall first confirm it by a scripture or two. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few be there that find it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Now by these two texts, and by many more that will be urged anon, you may see the truth of what I have said, to enlarge therefore upon the truth, and first, more generally, and second, more particularly. More generally, I shall prove that in all ages, but few, few have been saved. More particularly, I shall prove but few of them that profess have been saved. First, generally, in all ages, but few have been saved. Number one, in the old world, when it was most populous, even in the days of Noah, we read but of eight persons that were saved out of it. Well, therefore, might Peter call them but few. But how few? Why, but eight souls. Wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. That's First Peter chapter 3, verse 20. He touches a second time upon this truth, saying, He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Now mark, mark this, all the rest are called the ungodly, and there were also an entire world of them. These are also taken notice of in Job, and go there also by the name of wicked men. Have you marked the old way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overthrown with a flood, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? That's Job chapter 22, verses 15 through 17. And there were, therefore, but eight persons that escaped the wrath of God in the day that the flood came upon the earth, and the rest were ungodly. There was also a world of them, and they are to this day in the prison of hell. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Nay, I must correct my pen. There were but seven of the eight that were good. For Ham, though he escaped the judgment of the water, yet the curse of God overtook him to his damnation. Number two, when the world began again to be replenished, and people began to multiply therein, how few, even in all ages, do we read of that were saved from the damnation of the world? First, one, Abraham and his wife, God called out of the land of the Chaldeans. I called, said God, Abraham alone. That's Isaiah chapter 51, verse 2. Second, one, Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, out of Adma and Zeboim. One lot out of four cities. Indeed, his wife and two daughters went out of Sodom with him, but they all three proved not, as you may see in the 19th chapter of Genesis. And wherefore, Peter observes that Lot only was saved. He turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, that righteous man. 
Now read 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Jude says that in this condemnation, God overthrew not only Sodom and Gomorrah, but the cities about them also. And yet you find none but Lot could be found that was righteous, either in Sodom or Gomorrah, or the cities about them. Wherefore they, all of them, suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. And that's verse 7. Third, now we come to the time of the judges. How few then were godly, even then when the inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel. The highways of God were then unoccupied. Judges chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Fourthly, there were but few in the days of David. Help, Lord, says he, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. That's Psalm 12, verse 1. Fifthly, in Isaiah's time, the saved were come to such a few that he positively says that there were a very small number left. God had made them like Sodom, and they had been like unto Gomorrah. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Sixthly, it was cried unto them in the time of Jeremiah that they should run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeks the truth, and I will pardon it, as Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1. Seventh, God showed his servant Ezekiel how few there would be saved in his day, by the vision of a few hairs saved out of the midst of a few hairs. For the saved were a few saved out of a few. Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5. Eighthly, you can find in the time of the prophet Micah how the godly complain that as to number, they then were so few that he compares them to those that are left behind when they had gathered the summer fruit. That's Micah chapter 7, verse 1. Ninthly, when Christ was come, how did he confirm this truth, that but few of them that put in claim for heaven will have it for their inheritance? But the common people could not hear it. And therefore, upon a time when he did but a little hint at this truth, the people, even all in the synagogue where he preached it, were filled with wrath, rose up, and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Luke chapter 4, verses 24 through 29. Tenthly, John, who is after Christ, saith, The whole world lieth in wickedness, that all the world wondered after the beast, that the power was given to the beast over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Well, power to do what? Why, to cause all, both great and small, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive his mark and to be branded for him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, and also Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 16. Eleventhly, should we come to observation and experience, the show of the countenance of the bulk of men doth witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom, and they hide it not. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 9. Where is the man that maketh the Almighty God his delight, and that designeth his glory in the world? Do not even almost all pursue this world, their lusts and pleasures? And so, consequently, say unto God, 
depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways, or what is the Almighty that we should serve him? It is in vain to serve God, etc. So that without a doubt, it will appear a truth in the day of God, that but few of them that shall put in their claim to heaven will have it for their inheritance. Now before I pass this head, I will show you to what the saved are compared in the scriptures. Number one, they are compared to a handful. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains, etc. That's Psalm 72, verse 16. This corn is nothing else but them that shall be saved. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, and Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. But mark here, there shall be a handful. What is a handful when compared with the whole heap? Or what is a handful out of the rest of the world? Number two, as they are compared to a handful, so they are compared to a lily among the thorns, which is rare and not so commonly seen. As the lily among thorns, saith Christ, so is my love among the daughters. That's Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 2. By thorns, we understand the worst and best of men even all that are destitute of the grace of God. For the best of them is a briar, the most upright of them as a thorn. That's Micah chapter 7 verse 4 and 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 6. I know that she may be called a lily amongst thorns also, because she meets with the pricks of persecution. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 24. And she may also be thus termed, to show the disparity that is between hypocrites and the church. That's Luke chapter 8, verse 14, and Hebrews 8. But this is not all. The saved are compared to a lily among thorns, to show you that they are but few in the world to show you that they are but few and rare. For as Christ compares her to a lily among thorns, so she compares him to an apple tree among the trees of the wood, which is rare and scarce and not common. Number three, they that are saved are called, but one of many. For though there be three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. Yet my love, saith Christ, is but one. My undefiled is but one. That's Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. According to that of Jeremiah, I will take you one out of a city. That's Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. That saying of Paul is much like this. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. But one, that is, few of many, few of them that run, for he is not here comparing them that run with them, that sit still, but with them that run. Some run and lose. Some run and win. They that run and win are few in comparison with them that run and lose. They that run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. Let there then be three score queens and fourscore concubines, and virgins without number. And yet the saved are but few. Number four. They that are saved are compared to the gleaning after the vintage is in. Woe is me, said the church, 
For I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits, as the grape gleanings, after the vintage is in. That's Micah chapter 7, verse 1. The gleanings. What are the gleanings to the whole crop? And yet you here see to the gleanings, are the saved compared? It is the devil and sin that carry away the cartloads while Christ and his ministers come after a gleaning. But the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim are better than the vintage of Abiazir. That's Judges chapter 8 verse 2. Them that Christ and his ministers glean up and bind up in the bundle of life are better than than the loads that go the other way. You know it is often of or it is often the cry of the poor in harvest. Poor gleaning, poor gleaning. And yet the ministers of the gospel, they also cried, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. When the prophet speaks of the saved under this metaphor of gleaning, how does he amplify the matter? Gleaning grapes shall be left, says he, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord. Isaiah chapter 17, verse 6. Thus you see, what gleaning is left in the vineyard after the vintage is in? Two or three here, four or five there. Alas, they that shall be saved when the devil and hell have had their due, they will be but as the gleaning. They will be but few. They that go to hell go there in clusters. But the saved go not so to heaven. Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, and Micah uh, chapter 7. Wherefore, when the prophet speaks of the saved, he says there is no cluster. But when he speaks of the damned, he says that they are gathered by clusters. That's Revelation chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. Oh, sinners, but few will be saved. Oh, professors, those are those who say that I believe that I'm a Christian, but few will be saved. Number five, they that shall be saved are compared to jewels, and they shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. That's Malachi chapter 3, verse 17. Now, jewels, you know, are rare things things that are not found in every house. Jewels will lie in little room, being few and small, though lumber takes up so much. In almost every house, you may find brass and iron and lead, and in every place you may find hypocritical professors. But the saved are not these common things. They are God's peculiar treasure. Psalm 135, verse 4. Wherefore, Paul distinguishes between the lumber and the treasure in the house. There is, says he, in a great house, not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Here is a word for wooden and earthly professors. The jewels and treasures are vessel to honor. They of wood and earth are vessels of dishonor. That is, vessels for destruction. Romans chapter 9, verse 21. Number six. They that shall be saved are compared to a remnant. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom. And we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9. A remnant 
a small remnant, a very small remnant. Oh, how doth the Holy Ghost word it, and all to show you how few shall be saved. Everyone knows, or at least I hope everyone knows, what a remnant is. But this is a small remnant, a very small remnant. And so again, sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. It's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 7. What shall I say? The saved are often in scripture called a remnant. In Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4 and 8. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 through 22. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 16. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 3. And Joel chapter 2, verse 32. But what is a remnant to the whole peace? What is a remnant of people to the whole kingdom? Or what is a remnant of wheat to the whole harvest? Number seven. The saved are compared to the tithe or tenth part. Wherefore, when God sends the prophet to make the hearts of the people fat, their ears dull, and to shut their eyes, the prophet asks, How long? To which God answers, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land shall be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet, as God says in another place, I will not make a full end, and it shall be a tenth. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. That's Isaiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Well, what is a tenth? What is one in ten? And yet so speaks the Holy Ghost, when he speaks of the holy seed, of those that were to be reserved from judgment. And observe it, the fattening and the blinding of the rest. It was to their everlasting destruction. And so, both Christ and Paul expound upon it often in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 4, verse 12. Luke chapter 8, verse 10. John chapter 12, verse 40. Acts chapter 28, verse 26. Romans chapter 11, verse 8 so that those that are reserved from them that perish will be very few, one in ten. A tenth shall return, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. I shall not add more generals at this time. I pray God that the world be not offended at this. But without doubt, but few of them that shall put in their claim for heaven will have it for their inheritance, which will yet further appear in the reading of that which follows. And now we come to the second part. Particularly, but few of them that profess, the ones that call themselves Christians, have been saved. Therefore, I come more particularly to show you that but few shall be saved. I say, but few of professors themselves will be saved. For that is the truth that the text does more directly look at and defend. Give me therefore your ear and your hand, good reader and listener in this case, and let us soberly walk through the rest of what shall be said. And let us compare as we go each particular with the Holy Scripture. Number one, it is said, The daughter of Zion is left 
as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 8. The vineyard was the church of Israel. The cottage in that vineyard was the daughter of Zion, or the truly gracious amongst or in that church. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. A cottage. God had but a cottage there. But a little habitation in the church, a very few that were truly gracious amongst that great multitude that professed. And had it not been for these, for this one cottage, the rest had been ruined as Sodom except the Lord of hosts had left unto us in the church a very few, they had been as Sodom. That's Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9 again. Wherefore, among the multitude of them that shall be damned, professors will make a considerable party. Number two. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them shall return. A remnant shall be saved. As Isaiah chapter 10 verse 22 and Romans chapter 9 verse 27. For though thy people Israel, whom thou broughtest out of Egypt, to whom thou hast given church constitution, holy laws, holy ordinances, holy prophets, and holy covenants, thy people by separation from all peoples, and thy people by profession, though this thy people be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant shall be saved. Wherefore, among the multitude of them that shall be damned, professors will make a considerable party. Now I'm going to interject here just a minute to add something that Bunyan hasn't put in here. Consider the people that were delivered out of the land of Egypt. God showed mighty miracles in those days. In Egypt, ten, to be precise. Another when he parted the Red Sea. Yet, out of all those people that were delivered, every single one of them over the age of twenty were killed in the wilderness. They were cast out. They were cast out. Think about it. A remnant. Very small indeed. Okay, I continue. Number three. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord has rejected them. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30. And the people here under consideration are called, in verse 27, God's people. His people by profession. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that you may know and try their way. Try their way means to judge them by their ways. Trees known by its fruit. Well, what follows? They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders, reprobate silver. The Lord has rejected them. In chapter 7, verse 29, they are also called the generation of his wrath. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. This, therefore, I gather out of these holy scriptures, that with reference to profession and church constitution, a people may be called the people of God, but with reference to the event and final conclusion that God will make with some of them, they may be truly the generation of his wrath. Number four, the fifth chapter of Isaiah, we read again of the vineyard of God and that it was planted on a very fruitful hill, planted with the choicest vines. It had a wall, a tower, a wine press belonging to it, and all things that could be put it into right order and good government as a church. But this vineyard of the Lord of hosts brought forth 
wild grapes, fruits unbecoming her constitution and government. Wherefore the Lord takes from her his hedge and wall and lets her be trodden down. Read Christ's exposition upon it in Matthew chapter 21, verse 33, etc. Look to it, professing Christians. These are the words of the text. Quote, For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Close quote. Number five. Son of man, said God to the prophet, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead. In the midst of the furnace, they even are the dross of silver. That's Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 18. God had silver there, some silver, but it was but little. The bulk of the people was but the dross of the church, though they were the members of it. Well, what does he mean by the dross? Well, he looked upon them as no better, notwithstanding their church membership, than the rabble of the world, that is, with respect to their latter end. For to be called dross is to be put amongst the rest of the sinners in the world, in the judgment of God though at present they abide in his house. In other words, they're part of the visible church. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love thy testimonies. Psalm 119, verse 119. God says of his saved ones, He has chosen them in the furnace of affliction. Affliction. The refiner, when he puts his silver into the furnace, he puts lead in also among it. Now this lead, being ordered as he knows how, works up the dross from the silver, which dross, still as it rises, he putteth by, or taketh away with an instrument. And thus deals God with his church. There is silver in his church, I. There is also dross. Now the dross are the hypocrites and the graceless ones that are got into the church. And these will God discover and afterwards put away as dross. So that it will, without a doubt, prove a truth of God that many of their professors that shall put in claim for heaven will not have it for their inheritance. Number six, it is said of Christ, his fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. The floor is the church of God. O oh, my threshing, and the corn of my floor, said God by the prophet to his people. Isaiah chapter 21, verse 10. The wheat are these good ones in his church that shall be undoubtedly saved. And therefore he says, Gather my wheat into my garner. The chaff grows upon the same stalk and ear. And so is in the same visible body with the wheat. But there is no substance in it. And wherefore in time they must be severed one from the other. The wheat must be gathered into the garner, which is heaven. And the chaff, or professors that lack true grace, must be gathered into hell, that they may be burned up with unquenchable fire. Therefore, let professors look to it. Number seven. Christ Jesus casts away two of the three grounds that are said to receive the word. That's Luke chapter eight. 
The stony ground received it with joy, and the thorny ground brought forth fruit almost to perfection. Indeed, the highway ground was to show us that the carnal, whilst such, received not the word at all. But here is the pinch. Two of the three that received it fell short of the kingdom of heaven. They were almost Christians. For but one of the three received it so as to bring forth fruit to perfection. Look to it, professors. Number eight, the parable of the unprofitable servant, the parable of the man without the wedding garment, the parable of the unsavory salt. Do each of them justify this for truth? You can find those in Matthew chapter 25, verses 24, 29, and also chapter 22, verses 11 through 13, and also chapter 5, verse 13. That of the unprofitable servant is to show us the sloth and idleness of some professors. Again, professors in this text, this context, are people who call themselves Christians. That of the man without a wedding garment is to show us how some professing Christians, have the shame of their wickedness seen by God, even when they are among the children of the bridegroom. And that parable of the unsavory salt is to show that as the salt has lost its savor and is fit for nothing, no, not even for the dunghill, but to be trodden under the foot of men. And so... Some professing Christians, yea, and great ones as well. For this parable reached one of the apostles, who will in God's day be counted fit for nothing but to be trodden down as the mire in the streets. Oh, the slothful, the naked, and unsavory professors. How will they be rejected of God and his Christ in the judgment? Look to it, professors. Number nine. The parable of the tares also gives countenance to this truth. For though it be said, the field is the world, yet it is also said that the tares were sown, even in the church. That's the visible church. And while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 and 25. Now here comes an objection. But some may object. The tares might be sown in the world among the wheat, though not in the churches. Well, here comes the answer. But Christ, by expounding this parable, tells us that the tares were sown in his kingdom. The tares, that is, the children of the devil, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom, his kingdom, all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And that's verse 30 and also verses 39 through 43. Look to it, professors. Number 10. The parable of the ten virgins also suits our purpose. These ten are called the kingdom of heaven, that is, the church of Christ, the visible, rightly constituted church of Christ. For they went all out of the world, had all of them lamps, had all went forth to meet the bridegroom. Yet behold, what an overthrow the one half of them met with at the gate of heaven. They were shut out, bidden to depart. And Christ told him that he did not know them. Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13. 
Tremble, professors. Pray, professors. Number 11. The parable of the net that was cast into the sea. That, that also countenances this truth. The substance of that parable is to show that souls may be gathered by the gospel. They're compared to a net. May be kept in that net, drawn to the shore, that is to the world's end, by that net. And yet may then prove to be bad fishes and be cast away. The parable runs thus, quote, The kingdom of heaven, that is the gospel, is like unto a net which was cast into the sea, that is the world, and gathered of every kind, that's good and bad, which, when it was full, they drew to shore, that is, to the end of the world, and sat down, that is, of the judgment, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. That's close quote. Some bad fishes, nay, I doubt, a great many, will be found in the net of the gospel at the day of judgment. Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 and 49. Watch, watch, and be sober, professors. Number 12. And many shall come from the east and from the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out. Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. The children of the kingdom, whose privileges were said to be these, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Romans chapter 9, verse 4. I take liberty to harp the more upon the first church, that is the Jews, because that, that happened to them, happened as types and examples, intimating that there is a ground to think, that things of as a dreadful a nature as are to happen among the church of the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 10, verses 11 and 12. In other words, he's saying it's not just the Jews he's talking about. Neither. Indeed, have the Gentile churches security from God that there shall not as dreadful things happen to them. And concerning this very thing, sufficient caution is given to us also. And here come the verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Philippians, chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 26 through 28. Second Peter, 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. And Revelation chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Number 13. The parable of the true vine and its branches confirm what I have said. By the vine, there I understand Christ. Christ as head. By the branches, I understand this church. And some of these branches proved fruitless, cast always, were in time cast out of the church, were gathered by men, and burned. That's John chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. Number 14. Lastly, I will come now to particular instances. First, the twelve had a devil among them. John chapter 6, verse 70. Second, Ananias and Sapphira were in the church of Jerusalem, Acts 5. Number three, Simon Magus was among them at Samaria, that's Acts chapter 8. Fourth, among the church of Corinth 
for them that had not the knowledge of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. Fifthly, Paul tells the Galatians that false brethren crept in unawares, and so does the apostle Jude, and yet they were as quick-sighted to see as any nowadays. And that's Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, and Jude 4. Sixth, sixthly, the church in Sardis had but a few names in her to whom the kingdom of heaven belonged. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. Seventh, as for the church of the Laodiceans, it is called wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. So, that putting all things together, and I may boldly say, as I also have said already, that among the multitude of them that shall be damned, professing Christians will make a considerable party. Or, to speak in the words of the observation, quote, when men have put in all the claim they can for heaven, but few will have it for their inheritance, close quote. Now we come to the reasons why few are saved. I will show you some reasons of the point, besides those five that I showed you before. And, first, I will show you why the poor, carnal, ignorant world miss of heaven. And then, second, why the knowing, professing Christians miss of it as well. First, why the poor, carnal, ignorant world miss heaven. Number one, the poor, carnal, ignorant world miss of heaven even because they love their sins and cannot part with them. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John chapter 3 verse 19. The poor ignorant world miss of heaven because they are enemies in their minds to God, his word, and holiness. They must all be damned who take pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 10 through 12. The poor ignorant world miss of heaven because they stop their ears against convictions. In other words, they cry out, judge not, judge not, when it's pointed out to them that they're living in sin. And they refuse to come when God calls. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at nothing all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity, and I will mock when your fear cometh, as desolation and your destruction as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Number two. The poor, ignorant world miss of heaven, because the God of this world has blinded their eyes, that they can neither see the evil and damnable state that they are in at present, nor the way to get out of it. And neither do they see the beauty of Jesus Christ, nor how willing he is to save poor sinners. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Number three. The poor, ignorant world miss of heaven because they put off and defer coming to Christ until the time of God's patience and grace is over. Some indeed are resolved never to come, but some again say, well, we'll come hereafter. And so it comes to pass that because God called, in other words, they had the gospel preached to them, and they did not hear and so they shall cry. And I will not hear, said the Lord. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 through 13. 
Now, mind you, Bunyan here is going on about the world, not the professing Christians as of yet. Number four, the poor, ignorant world miss of heaven because they have false apprehensions of God's mercy. They say in their hearts, we shall have peace, though we walk in the imagination of our heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. But what said the word? The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verses 19 through 21. Number five. The poor ignorant world miss of heaven because they make light of the gospel that offereth mercy to them for free. And because they lean upon their own good meanings and thinkings and doings. In other words, they trust their own hearts and in the strength of their own arms. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 9, verses 30 and 31. Number six. The poor carnal world miss of heaven because by unbelief which reigns in them. They are kept forever from being clothed with Christ's righteousness and from the washing in his blood, without which there is neither remission of sin nor justification, but to pass these till anon. Second, I come in the next place to show you some reasons why the professing, uh, professing Christian fall short of heaven. Well, first, in the general, they rest in things below special grace, as in awakenings that are not special, in faith that is not special, etc. And a little, to run a parallel between the one and the other, that, if God will, you may see and escape. For one, have they that shall be saved, awakenings about their state by nature. Well, so have they that shall be damned. They that never go to heaven may see much of sin, and of the wrath of God do thereto. And this had Cain and Judas, and yet they came short of the kingdom. Genesis 4 and Matthew chapter 27 verse 4. The saved have convictions in order to their eternal life. But the other's convictions are not so. The convictions of the one doth drive them sincerely to Christ. The convictions of the other doth drive them to the law, and the law to desperation at last. Number two, there is a repentance that will not save. A repentance to be repented of and a repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Yet, so great a similitude and likeness there is between the one and the other, that most times the wrong one is taken for the right one. And though this mistake, and through this mistake, professing Christians perish. As, for example, First, in saving repentance, there will be an acknowledgement of sin, and one that hath the other repentance may acknowledge his sins also. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Second, in saving repentance, there is a crying out under sin, but one that hath the other repentance may cry out under sin as well. Genesis chapter 4, verse 13. Thirdly, in saving repentance, there will be humiliation for sin. And the one that hath the other repentance may humble himself also. 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 29. Fourthly, saving repentance is attended with self-loathing. But he that hath the other repentance may have loathing of sin also. A loathing of sin, because it is sin, that he cannot have. 
but a loathing of sin because it is offensive to him, that he may have. The dog doth not loathe that which troubles his stomach because it is there, but because it troubles him. When it has done troubling of him, he can turn to it again and lick it up, as before it troubled him. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. Fifthly, saving repentance is attended with prayers and tears. But he that hath none but the other repentance may have prayers and tears also. Genesis chapter 27, verses 34 and 35. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. Sixthly, in saving repentance, there is fear and reverence of the word and ministers that bring it. But this may be also where there is none but the repentance that is not saving. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy and observed him. When he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Mark chapter 6, verse 20. Seventhly, saving repentance makes a man's heart very tender of doing anything against the word of God. But Balaam could say, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord. Numbers chapter 24, verse 13. Behold then, how far a man may go in repentance, and yet be short of that which is called repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. A. He may be awakened. B. He may acknowledge his sin. C. He may cry out under the burden of sin. D. He may have humility for it. E. He may even loathe it. F. He may have prayers and tears against it. G. He may delight to do many things of God. H. May even be afraid of sinning against him. And after all this, may perish for lack of saving repentance. Secondly, or second. Have they that shall be saved faith? Why, they that shall not be saved may have faith also. Yea, a faith in many things, so like the faith that saves, that they can hardly be distinguished, though they differ both in root and branch. To come to particulars. Number one, saving faith has Christ for its object, and so may the faith have that is not saving. Those very Jews of whom it is said they believed on Christ, Christ tells them, and that after their believing, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. John chapter 8, verses 30 through 44. Number two, saving faith is wrought by the word of God, and so may the faith be that is not saving. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Number three, saving faith looks for justification without works, and so may a faith do that is not saving. James chapter 2, verse 18. Number four, saving faith will sanctify and purify the heart, and the faith that is not saving may work a man off from the pollutions of the world, as it did Judas, Demas, and others. Second Peter 2. Number five, saving faith will give a man tastes of the world to come, and also joy by those tastes. And so will the faith do that is not saving. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Number six, saving faith will help a man, if called thereto, to give his body to be burned for religion. And so will the faith do that is not saving. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Number seven, saving faith will help a man to look for an inheritance in the world to come, and that may the faith do that is not saving. All those virgins took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Number eight, 
Saving faith will not only make a man look for, but prepare to meet the bridegroom. And so may the faith do that is not saving. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Matthew chapter 25, verse 7. Number 9. Saving faith will make a man look for an interest in the kingdom of heaven with confidence. And the faith that is not saving will even demand entrance of the Lord. Lord, Lord, open to us. Matthew chapter 25, verse 11. Number 10. Saving faith will have good works follow it into heaven. And the faith that is not saving may have great works follow it as far as to heaven's gates. Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Now then, if the faith that is not saving may have Christ for its object, be wrought by the word, look for justification without works, work men off from the pollutions of the world, and give men tastes of, and joy in the things of another world, I say again, if it will help a man to burn for his judgment, and to look for an inheritance in another world, yea, if it will help a man to prepare for it, claim interest in it, and if it can carry great works, many great and glorious works, as far as heaven's gates, then no marvel if abundance of people take this kind of faith for saving faith, and so fall short of heaven thereby. Alas, my friends, there are but few that can produce such works for repentance and such faith. As yet you see, I have proved, even reprobates have had in several ages of the church. But... Now we move on to the third point. They that go to heaven are a praying people. But a man may pray that shall not be saved. Pray. He may pray. Pray daily. Yea, he may ask of God the ordinances of justice and may take delight in approaching to God. Nay, further, such souls may, as it were, cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying out. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 2, Malachi chapter 2, verse 13. Fourth point. Do God's people keep holy fasts? They that are not his people may keep fasts also, may keep fasts often, even twice a week. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as his tax collector. I fast twice in the week. I give 10% of all my gross income. Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. I might enlarge upon things, but I intend but a little book. And I do not question, but many Baalamites will appear before the judgment seat to condemnation. Men that have had visions of God and that knew the knowledge of the Most High. Men that have had the Spirit of God come upon them, and that have been, or that have by that been made different men. Yet these shall go to the generations of their fathers. They shall never see light. Numbers chapter 24, verses 2, 4, and 16. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 6 through 10. Psalm 49, verse 19. I read of some men whose excellency in religion mounts up to the heavens and their heads reach unto the clouds who yet shall perish forever like their own dung and he that in this world hath seen them shall say at the judgment where are they Job chapter 20 verses 5 through 7 there will be many a one that were gallant professors in this world be lacking among the saved in the day of Christ's coming. Yea, many whose damnation was never even dreamed of. Which of the twelve ever thought that Judas would have proved a devil? 
Nay, when Christ suggested that one among them was not, they each were most afraid of them, or they were more afraid of themselves than of him. Matthew chapter 26, verses 21 through 23. Well, who questioned the salvation of the foolish virgins? Well, the wise ones did not. They gave them the privilege of communion with themselves. Matthew chapter 25. The discerning of the heart and the infallible proof of the truth of saving grace is reserved to the judgment of Jesus Christ at his coming. The church and best of saints sometimes hit and sometimes miss in their judgments about this matter. And the cause of our missing in our judgment is, first, partly because we cannot infallibly at all times distinguish grace that saves from that which does but appear to do so. Second, partly also because some men have the art to give right names to wrong things. Third, and partly because we, being commanded to receive him that is weak, are afraid to exclude the least Christian. By a hidden means, hypocrites creep into the churches. But what saith the scripture? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. That means I try the mind. Because the mind governs the heart, or supposed to govern the heart. And again, all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 20, Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10, and Revelation chapter 2 verse 23. And to this searcher of hearts is the time of infallible discerning reserved. And then you shall see how far grace that is not saving has gone, and also how few will be saved indeed. Oh, Lord, awaken poor sinners by my little book. Now here comes the use and application of the whole. I come now to make brief use and application of the whole, and use first. My first word shall be to the openly profane. Poor sinner. You read here, listen here, that but a few will be saved, that many that expect heaven will go without heaven. What do you say to this, poor sinner? Let me say it over again. There are but few to be saved, very few. Let me add, but few professing Christians, but few eminent professing Christians. What do you say now, sinner? If judgment begins at the house of God, what will the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And this is Peter's question. Well, can you answer it, sinner? Yea, I say again, if judgment must begin at them, will it not make you think, what shall become of me? And I add, when you shall see the stars of heaven to tumble down to hell, can you think that such a muck heap of sin as you are shall be lifted up to heaven? And Peter asks thee another question, to wit, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18. Can you answer this question, sinner? Stand among the righteous you may not. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Psalm chapter 1, verse 5. Stand among the wicked, thou then will not dare to do. Where will you appear, sinner? To stand among the hypocrites will avail you nothing. The hypocrite shall not come before him. That is, with acceptance but shall perish. Job 13, verse 16. Because it concerns you much, let me over with it again. When you shall see less sinners than you are, 
bound up by angels in bundles and thrown into hell, where will you appear, sinner? You may wish yourself another man, but that will not help you, sinner. You may wish what I had been converted in time, but that also will not help you either. And if, like the wife of Jeroboam, you should feign yourself to be another woman, the prophet, the Lord Jesus, would soon find you out. What will you do, poor sinner? Heavy tidings, heavy tidings will attend thee, except you repent. Poor sinner. 1 Kings chapter 14 verses 2, 5, and 6. Luke chapter 13 verses 3 and 5. Oh, the dreadful state of a poor sinner, of an openly profane sinner. Everybody that hath but common sense knows that this man is in the broad way to death, yet he laughs at his own damnation. And shall I come to particulars with you? Number one, poor unclean sinner, the harlot's house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 18, Proverbs 5, verse 5, Proverbs 7, verse 27. Number two, poor, swearing, and thievish sinner. God has prepared the curse that every one that steals shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that swears shall be cut off as on that side according to it. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 3. Number 3. Poor drunken sinner, what shall I say to you? Woe to the drunkards of Ephraim! Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and of men, and men of strong drink! They shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Number 4, poor, covetous, worldly man. God's word says that the covetous, the Lord abhors. That the covetous man is an idolater, and that the covetous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Psalm 10, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Number 5. And you, liar, what will you do? All liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone. Revelation chapter 21, verses 8 and 27. And I shall not enlarge, poor sinner. Let no man deceive you. For because of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 6. Therefore, give thee a short call, and so, or I will therefore give thee a short call, and so leave you. Sinner, awake! Yea, I say unto you, awake! Sin lies at the door, and God's axe lies at the root. And hell fire is right underneath you. Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. I say again, awaken! Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. Poor sinner, awaken! Eternity is coming. And his son... They are both coming to judge the world. Awaken. Are you asleep, poor sinner? Let me set the trumpet to your ear once again. The heavens will be shortly on a burning flame. The earth and the works thereof shall be burned up. And then wicked men shall go into perdition. Do you hear this, O sinner? 2 Peter 3, 
Hearken again. The sweet morsels of sin will then be fled and gone, and the bitter burning fruits of them only left. What do you say now, sinner? Can you drink hell fire? Will the wrath of God be a pleasant dish to eat? This must be your every day's meat and drink in hell, sinner. And I'll add one more thing. That day of the Lord comes at the day of your death. And none of us know when that day is. It comes upon us like a thief in the night. Repent, sinner. Continuing. I will yet propound to you God's ponderous question. And then, for this time, leave you. Can your heart endure, or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with you, said the Lord? Is Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 14. What sayest thou? Wilt thou answer this question now, or wilt thou even take time to do it? Or will you be desperate and venture all? And let me put this text in your ear to keep it open. And so the Lord may have mercy upon you. Upon the wicked shall the Lord rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Psalm 11, verse 6. Repent, sinners. Now here comes the second use. My second word is to them that are upon the potter's wheel, concerning whom we know not as yet whether their convictions and awakenings will end in conversion or not. Several things I shall say to you, both to further your convictions and to caution you from staying anywhere below or short of saving grace. Number one, remember, that but few shall be saved. And if God should count you worthy to be one of that few, what a mercy would that be? Number two, be thankful, therefore, for convictions, because conversion begins at conviction, though all conviction does not end in conversion. It is a great mercy to be convinced that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. Count it, therefore, a mercy and that your convictions may end in conversion. Do thou take heed of stifling of them? It is the way of poor sinners to look upon convictions as things that are hurtful, and therefore they use to shun the awakening ministry and to check a convincing conscience. Such poor sinners are much like to the wanton boy that stands at the maid's elbow to blow out her candle as fast as she lights it at the fire. Convinced sinner, God lights your candle, and you put it out. God lights it again, and you put it out. Yea, how often is the candle of the wicked put out? Job chapter 21, verse 17. At last, God resolves, he will light your candle no more. And then, like the Egyptians, you dwell all your days in darkness and never see light any more, but by the light of hell fire. Wherefore, give glory to God. And if he awakens your conscience, quench not your convictions. Do it, said the prophet, before he cause darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains and he turn your convictions into the shadow of death and make them gross darkness. It's Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 16. First, be willing to see the worst of your condition. It is better to see it here than in hell, for you must see your misery either here or there. Second, beware of little sins for they will pave the way for bigger sins, and they will again make way for bigger, upon which God's wrath will follow. And then may your latter end be worse than at your beginning. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. 
Thirdly, take heed of bad company and evil communication. That will corrupt good manners. It will corrupt it. God says, evil company will turn you away from following him and will tempt you to serve other gods, devils. So the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 4. Fourthly, beware of such a thought as bids you delay repentance. For that is damnable. Proverbs 1 verse 24, Zechariah chapter 7 verses 12 and 13. Fifth, beware of taking example by some poor carnal professor whose religion lies in the tip of his tongue. Beware, I say, of the man whose head swims with notions, but his life is among the unclean. Job chapter 36 verse 14. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13, verse 20. Number six, or sixthly, give yourself much to the word and prayer and good conference. Seventh, labor to see the sin that cleaves to the best of your performances. In other words, your motive. And know that all is nothing if you be not found in Jesus Christ. Eighthly, keep in remembrance that God's eye is upon your heart and upon all your ways. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, said the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, said the Lord? Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 24. Ninth. Be often meditating upon death and judgment. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 9 and Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 14. Tenth, be often thinking what a dreadful end sinners that have neglected Christ will make at that day of death and judgment. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31. Eleventhly, put thyself often in your thoughts before Christ's judgment seat in your sins, and consider with yourself, were I now before the judge, how would I look? How should I shake and tremble? Twelfthly, be often thinking of them that are now in hell, past all mercy. I say, be often thinking of them. Thus, they were once in the world, as I now am. They once took delight in sin, as I have done. They once neglected repentance, as Satan would have me do. But now they are gone. Now they are in hell. Now the pit hath shut her mouth upon them. Thou mayest also doubt thy thoughts of the damned, thus. If these poor creatures were in the world again, would they sin as they did before? Would they neglect salvation as they did before? If they had sermons as I have, if they had the Bible as I have, if they had good company as I have, yea, if they had a day of grace as I have, would they neglect it as they did before? Sinner, couldst thou soberly think of these things, they might help. God blessing them to awaken you, and to keep you awake to repentance, to the repentance that is to salvation, never to be repented of. Now here comes an objection. And then this kind of preaching always comes with objections. I'm sure a few of you listening have some, but Bunyan here treats with this. Objection. But you have said, few shall be saved and some that go a great way, yet are not saved. At this, therefore, I am even discouraged and weakened. I think I had as good go no further. In other words, I might as well stop. I am indeed under conviction, but I may perish anyway. And if I go on in my sins, I will but perish. And it is ten, twenty, and a hundred to one if I be saved. 
Should I ever be so earnest for heaven? Well, answer. That few will be saved must needs be a truth, because Christ said it. That many go far and come short of heaven is as true, being testified by the same hand. But what then? Why then had I as good never seek? In other words, why did I even bother to go after it? Well, who told you so? Must nobody seek because few are saved? And this is just contrary to the text that bids us, therefore, to strive, to strive to enter in, because the gate is straight, and because many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Well, why go back again, seeing that is the next way to hell? Never go over hedge and ditch to hell. If I must needs go thither, I will go the furthest way about. Well, but who can tell? Though there should not be saved as many as there shall, but you may be one of that few. They that miss of life perish, because they will not let go of their sins, or because they take up a profession short of the saving faith of the gospel. They perish, I say, because they are content with such things as will not prove graces of a saving nature when they come to be tried in the fire. Otherwise, the promise is free and full and everlasting. Him that cometh to me, saith Christ, I will in no wise cast out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 6, verse 37, and John 3, verse 16. Wherefore, let not this thought, few shall be saved, weaken your heart. But let it give you cause to mend your pace, to mend your cries, to look well to your grounds for heaven. Let it make you fly faster from sin to Christ. Let it keep you awake and out of carnal security, and you may be saved. Use third. My third word is to professing Christians. Sirs, give me leave to set my trumpet to your ears again a little. When every man hath put in all the claim they can for heaven, but few will have it for their inheritance. And I mean but few professors, for so the text intends, and so I have also proved. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Let me therefore a little expostulate the matter with you, O ye thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of professors. Number one, I actually added those to the hundreds of thousands and millions. Number one, I begin with you, whose religion lies only in your tongues. I mean you, who are little or nothing known from the rest of the rabble of the world. Only you can talk a little better than they can. Hear me a word or two. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, that is, love to God and Christ and saints and holiness, I am nothing. No child of God, and so have nothing to do with heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. A prating tongue will not unlock the gates of heaven, nor blind the eyes of the judge. Now look to it. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fail. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 8. Number two, covetous professor, you that make a gain of religion, that uses your profession to bring grist to the mill, look to it also. In other words, you are in it for the money. Gain is not godliness. Judas' religion lay much in the bag, but his soul is now burning in hell. All covetousness is idolatry. Well, but what is that, or what will you call it, when men are religious for filthy losers' sake? That means money. That means pastors who use the Levitical tithe to, as a prerequisite for church membership. You know it's wrong, but you do it anyway. Bunyan's talking to you. Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 31. Number three, 
wanton professors. I encourage you to look up that word wanton if you don't know what it is. W-A-N-T-O-N. Wanton professors. I have a word for you. I mean you that can tell how to misplead scripture, to maintain your pride, your banqueting, and your abominable idolatry. Read what Peter says. You are the snare and damnation of others. You allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean, escape from them who live in error. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. And besides, the Holy Ghost has a great deal against you for your feastings and eating without fear, not for health, but gluttony. Jude 12. Further, Peter says that you count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, or you that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, are spots and blemishes, sporting yourselves with your own deceivings. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. And let me ask, did God give his word to justify your wickedness? Or did grace teach you to plead for the flesh? Or the making provision for the lust thereof? Of these also are they that feed their bodies to strengthen their lusts, under pretense of strengthening frail nature. But pray, remember the text, many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number four, I come next to the opinionist. I mean, to him whose religion lies in some circumstantials of religion. With this sort, this kingdom swarms at this day. These think all out of the way that are not of their mode when themselves may be out of the way in the midst of their zeal for their opinions. Pray, do you also observe the text? Many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. This might be referring to those guys who are contextual scripture critics. Number five, neither is the formalist exempted from this number. He is a man that hath lost all but the shell of religion. And he is hot indeed for his form, and no marvel, for that is his all to contend for. But his form, being without the power and spirit of godliness, it will leave him in his sins, nay. He standeth now in them, in the sight of God, and is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Number 6. The legalist comes next. Even him that hath no life but what he makes out of his duties. This man has chosen to stand or fall by Moses, who is the condemner of the world. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. John chapter 5, verse 45. Number 7. There is in the next place the libertine. He that pretends to be against forms and duties as things that gender to bondage, neglecting the order of God. This man pretends to pray always, but under that pretense prays not at all. He pretends to keep every day a Sabbath, but this pretense serves him only to cast off all set times for the worship of God. These are the people that say, well, every day is the Sabbath day for me. I'm like this all the time. I know, I've, I've even seen this myself on social media before. I'm sure some of you listening have, have too. This is also one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. Number 8. There is the temporizing latitude, uh, latitudinarian. Latitudinarian. He is a man that has no God but his belly, nor any religion but that by which his belly is worshipped. His religion is always, like the times, turning this way and that way, 
like the cock on the steeple, the rooster on the steeple. Neither hath he any conscience but a benumbed and seared one, and is next door to a downright atheist, and also is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number nine, there is also the willfully ignorant professor, or him that is afraid to know more for fear of the cross. He is for picking and choosing of truth, and loves not to hazard his all for that worthy name by which he would be called. When he is at any time overset by arguments or awakenings of conscience, he uses to heal all by, I was not brought up in this faith, as if it were unlawful for Christians to know more than has been taught them at the first conversion. Now, they use that as an excuse. Well, I wasn't raised a Christian, so how, was I, how, how, how am I supposed to know? Okay, There are many scriptures that lie against this man as the mouths of great guns, and he is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number 10. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm almost finished here. We will add to all these the professor that would prove himself a Christian by comparing himself with others instead of comparing himself with the word of God. Now this man comforts himself because he is as holy as such and such. He also knows as such as that old professor, and then concludes he shall go to heaven, as if he certainly knew that those with whom he compares himself would be undoubtedly saved. Well, how if he should be mistaken? Nay, may they not both fall short? But to be sure, he is in the wrong that hath made the comparison and a wrong foundation will not stand in the day of judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. This man, therefore, is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number 11. There is yet another professor, and he is for God and for Baal as well. You guys call him Baal. I pronounce it Baal. He can be anything for any company. He can throw stones with both hands. His religion alters as fast as his company. He is a frog of Egypt and can live in the water and out of the water. He can live in religious company and again as well out. Nothing that is disorderly comes amiss to him. And he will hold with the hare and run with the hound. He carries fire in the one hand and water in the other. He is a very anything but what he should be. This also is one of the many that will seek to end it and, and will not be able. This is the person who sits on the fence. Number 12. There is also that free willer, the Arminian, who denies to the Holy Ghost this soul, work, and conversion. And that Socinian, who denies to Christ that he has made to God satisfaction for sin. And that Quaker, who takes from Christ the two natures in his person. I might add as many more, touching whose damnation, they dying as they are, the scripture is plain. These will seek to enter in and shall not be able. But, here comes the fourth use. If it be so, what a strange disappointment will many professors meet with at the day of judgment. I speak not now to the openly profane. Everybody, as I have said, that has but common understanding between good and evil, knows that they are in the broad way to hell and damnation. And they must needs come thither. In other words, they have to go there. Nothing can hinder it but repentance unto salvation except God should prove a liar to save them, then it's hard to venture of that. Neither is it amiss if we take notice of the examples that are briefly mentioned in the scriptures concerning professors that have miscarried. Number one, Judas perished from among the apostles, Acts chapter one. Number two, Demas, as I think, 
perished from among the evangelists. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Number 3. Diatrephes from among the ministers, or them in office in the church. That's 3 John 9. Number 4. And as for Christian professors, they have fallen by heaps, and almost by entire churches. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, or verse 4 and verses 15 through 17. Number 5. Let us add to these that the things mentioned in the scriptures about these matters are but brief hints and items of what is afterwards to happen. As the apostles said, some men's sins are open beforehand, before going to judgment, or going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. So that, fellow professors, let us fear, lest a promise of being left us, of entering into this rest, any of us should come, or should seem to come short of it. Oh, to come short. Nothing kills like it. Nothing will burn like it. Now, I intend not discouragements, but rather awakenings. The churches have need of awakening, certainly, certainly in the 21st century. And so have all professors. Do not despise me, therefore, but hear me over again. What a strange disappointment will many professors meet with at the day of God Almighty. A disappointment, I say, and that as to several things. First, they will look to escape hell and yet fall just into the mouth of hell. What a disappointment will be here. Secondly, they will look for heaven, but the gate of heaven will be shut against them. What a disappointment is here. Third, they will expect that Christ should have compassion for them but will find that he hath shut up all bowels of compassion from them. What a disappointment is here. Again, now here's the fifth use. As this disappointment will be fearful, so certainly it will be very full of amazement. Number one, will it not amaze them to be unexpectedly excluded from life and salvation? Number two, Will it not be amazing to them to see their own madness and folly while they consider how they have dallied with their own souls and took lightly for granted that they had that grace that would save them but had left them in a damnable state? Number three, will they not also be amazed one at another while they remember how in their lifetime they counted themselves fellow heirs of life? To allude to that of the prophet, they shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 8. Number four. Will it not be amazing to some of the damned themselves to see some come to hell that then they shall see come thither? To see preachers of the word, professors of the word, practicers in the word to come thither. What wondering was there among them at the fall of the king of Babylon, since he thought to have swallowed up all, because he was run down by the Medes and the Persians? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art, there, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? If such a thing as this will, with amazement, surprise the damned, what an amazement will it be to them to see such a one as he, whose head reached to the clouds, to see him come down to the pit and perish forever like his own dung? Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. Isaiah 14 They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, 
and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? Is this he that professed and disputed and forsook us, but now is come to us again? Is this he that separated from us, but now he has fallen with us into the same eternal damnation with us? Here's the sixth use. Yet again, one word more. If I may awaken professing Christians, consider, though the poor carnal world shall certainly perish, yet they will want these things to aggravate their sorrow. They'll lack these things to aggravate their sorrow, which you will meet with in every thought that you will have of the condition you were in when you were in the world. Number one, they will not have a profession to bite them when they come thither. Number two, they will not have a taste of a lost heaven to bite them when they come thither. Number three, they will not have the thoughts of, I was almost in heaven, to bite them when they come thither. Number four, they will not have the thoughts of how they cheated saints, ministers, churches, to bite them when they come thither. Number five, they will not have the dying thoughts of false faith, false hope, false repentance, and false holiness to bite them when they come thither. I was at the gates of heaven. I looked into heaven. I thought I should have entered into heaven. Oh, how will these things sting? They will, if I may call them so, be the sting of the sting of death. In hell fire. Use seventh. Give me leave now in a word to give you a little advice. Number one. Do you love your own soul? If you do, then pray to Jesus Christ for an awakened heart. For a heart so awakened with all the things of another world that you may be a Lord to Jesus Christ. Number two. When you come there, Beg again for more awakenings about sin, hell, grace, and about the righteousness of Christ. Number three, cry also for a spirit of discernment, that you may know that which is saving grace indeed. Number four, above all studies. Apply yourself to the study of those things that show you the evil of sin, the shortness of man's life, and which is the way to be saved. Number five, keep company with the most godly among professors, which is going to be really hard in the year 2020, 2021, because of the internet, and nobody gathers together anymore. So again, that's really going to be difficult, but try anyway. Number six, when you hear what the nature of true grace is, defer not to ask your own heart if this grace be there. And here take heed first, that the preacher himself be sound and of good life. Second, that you take not seeming graces for real ones, nor seeming fruits for real fruits. Third, take heed that a sin in your life does not go, or goes not unrepented of. Take heed that a sin in your life goes not unrepented of, for that will make a flaw in your evidence, a wound in your conscience, and a breach in your peace, and a hundred to one, if at last it does not drive all the grace in you into so dark a corner of your heart that you shall not be able for a time by all the torches that are burning in the gospel, to find it out to your own comfort and consolation. That's the end of the book. And I would also like to add one thing. Personally, myself, I serve the Lord regardless of heaven or hell. I'd rather go to heaven. But if I go to hell, it doesn't matter. I serve the Lord with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. God chooses whether I go or whether I don't go. 
it's more important to serve him than to serve myself. And I'm hoping that after listening to this, and I hope you even go through it and listen to it again, that you can come to the same place within yourselves. Don't take for granted someone else's profession. Always seek with everything you've got for the kingdom of God. Anyway, that's what I got here. This was a long sermon. And uh, again, may the Lord Jesus Christ bless and preserve all of you. Amen.